Okay, very well. So, you know, I'll get started and I'll, I'll kind of take my time here um, as other people begin to log in. I wanted to do this talk because uh, A, I think it's something we don't talk about a lot and it's important for the residents, particularly the junior residents um, to understand. And also that this is really actually very high yield for, for the written boards, which is next Friday. Um, I think last year there was like five questions on spinal alignment on the boards and they're, they're easy and they're gimmies and we, and we shall get them. But moreover than that, it's just, this is something interesting that, you know, you know, that we should all understand when we're looking at x-rays. This is probably going to be very boring for the, for the attending faculty. Um, but this is primarily focused towards the, the juniors and, and those taking the boards or the residents who want to learn a little bit of more about what we look at when we're looking at x-rays. Um, like I said here, you know, we're going to talk about, first thing I'm going to mention is some anatomic differences between uh, humans and, and other mammals um, that allows for sustained upright posture and locomotion. Um, humans are the only habitual bipedal uh, mammal, um, and there are some reasons for that. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to talk about sagittal alignment, where it begins, the important of sagittal balance, and all the parameters um, that are associated. Um, we'll talk about the changes in sagittal alignment that occur over the course of one's life, comparing, you know, the upright x-rays of a 95-year-old to those of a 30-year-old, you know, are not, are not going to be, are not going to be very similar in most cases. Um, and that doesn't mean they're abnormal. Um, and then, you know, we'll talk about some, you know, basics of clinical evaluation and then a couple, you know, operative points. So the first thing I said, we'll talk a little bit about some anatomy. So I'll start with this. Um, this is probably one of the most famous and most well-known riddles um, dating back to the ancient times. Um, what is a creature that walks on four legs in the morning, two legs at noon and three in the evening? And I'm sure everybody knows the answer to this because it's so well-known, um, but the answer is the answer is man. Um, this is a picture of Oedipus here speaking to the Sphinx outside Thebes. Um, where she asked him uh, this question. So the answer is man. And we're not really going to talk about changes from, you know, uh, infant to adult, because there's a lot of uh, other things that are going on as the body develops. But we're more interested in, you know, the adult through uh, age into the elderly period. Obviously, here you see the, the, the elderly man more hunched over and using a cane. There's reasons for that. So looking at some different, so anatomy between humans and their cousins, the apes, you know, we can see a few things. I mean, the human spine, you know, has this S-shaped curve, a cervical lordosis, a thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, and sacral kyphosis, as well uh, with the uh, specific morphology of the pelvis, um, which is more retroverted compared to what you see in the, in, in the ape. The ape actually doesn't really have that S-shaped curve. It's it's straight to actually just a, like a smooth, mild kyphosis. And then the, and the, pel and the, and the pelvis is more flat. Um, what's the difference here? The human is standing upright and the ape is forward and needs to use the, the, the forelimbs in order to provide you know, uh, uh, movement. And why is that? It's because of center of gravity. The center of gravity in the, the human is, is basically head over the shoulders, over the hips, over the feet. Whereas the center of gravity in the, in the ape is anterior to the feet, and thus he's always being pulled forward. Again, this is the same thing, uh, just with some diagram, just some, with some markings here. But what I like about this picture is if you look at the ape here on the left, he's standing up on two feet, which they can do, but they can't do for a sustained period of time. And it doesn't look comfortable. There's a long, you know, a long, uh, basically panspinal kyphosis, the pelvis is super retroverted. The hips are flexed, and the knees are flat, and, and and the knees are flexed as well, trying to bring the the, uh, the the skeleton posterior. All this requires a lot of compensatory um, effort from the uh, axial and, and, and appendicular musculature, um, and increases energy expenditure and fatigue. Whereas in the human, everything is more balanced. So. You know, one thing we talk about with this, we're just kind of restating it, is what's the, the cone of economy. The cone of economy was coined by a French pediatric uh, orthopedic spine surgeon, Jean Dubosset, in the 90s. 
um, and basically reiterates this. So at the center of this cone of economy, um, the, 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 the organism is balanced. There's minimal muscle activity required to keep this upright posture. And as a result, there's low energy expenditure. And as you move forward or backward, this deviation increases uh, the amount of compensation you need to stand and results in increased expenditure as a result of utilizing other muscles um, and just general stress on, on the body. And then once you get to an extreme deviation where the center of gravity is far forward, um, you have an inability to stand upright at all. And you need external support uh, like a cane or a walker and et cetera. And that's kind of like the older gentleman here. He's much far forward and to allow you know comfortable uh, Know, bipedal movement, he needs, he needs this cane. He needs an extra support anterior to his center of gravity. So that's the basics there. So what, 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 what allows for this? And what are, the, what are the parameters that we need to know? Um, so a key concept of spinal alignment is that, you know, assuming there's no leg abnormalities, um, the spine and the pelvis provide for comfortable anti-gravity posture. Um, and the pelvis serves as a foundation for overall sagittal alignment. Um, this is the basic principle. Um, and, you know, with these, with the S-shaped curve and the pelvis um, within balance, uh, you have optimal sagittal alignment. Um, Dubosay actually called the, the pelvis, the, the pelvic vertebrae. So that just kind of emphasizes how it's uh, intimately related with the spine. So here's where we start to get into stuff that's super high yield for junior residents, taking the boards and just kind of general understanding of things. Um, so what do you need to know from the pelvis? There's three that you need to know, pelvic incidence, pelvic tilt, and the sacral slope. The main thing to know here is that the pelvic incidence is a fixed parameter, it's morphologic. It does increase through childhood, but it stabilizes in adulthood, um, and then it does not change. Pelvic tilt and sacral slope are postural uh, parameters, however, and they do change depending on patient position. Um, and so kind of what you need to know just from looking at this, this, this picture here is that, and sometimes residents are, you know, may confuse this, you have the pelvis here and you have the lumbar spine and the sacrum. They do not move independent from one, one another. Even though they're two different colors, this positioning is fixed in the adult spine. So if there is rotation here, um, either you know, clockwise or counterclockwise, you could say, the whole pelvis is moving as is the sacrum. So pelvic incidence this is probably the most important parameter to know. You know. Like I said, it's a morphologic parameter. It does not change after childhood. Morphologic studies have showed the average PI is about 55 degrees, which matches the lumbar lordosis. Um, and what is the angle? So to do it, you draw a line. It's basically the angle from a line drawn from the, uh, uh, center of the femoral head to the mid, uh, to, to the uh, midpoint of the uh, superior end plate of the sacrum and a line drawn perpendicular to that. And like I said, this does not, this does not change. So if you have a low pelvic incidence, um, what ends up happening is the, the femoral heads lie underneath, uh, underneath the sacrum. So everything kind of rotates. Well, the, in this case, because it's fixed, the, the sacrum would be, you can imagine the sacrum moving uh, clockwise and being more uh, directly, the, and being directly over the femoral heads. A higher PI means the femoral heads lie anterior to the sacrum. And that's more of a flat, flat kind of, uh, flat pelvis, uh, sorry, flat sacrum. Oops. Pelvic tilt is a positional parameter. This is an angle that's drawn from a line drawn from the midpoint of the uh, superior plate of the sacrum to the uh, center of the femoral head against a vertical reference line. Like I said, this does change with position. And this is super important to know because this is a major compensatory mechanism for sagittal balance. This is high yield for the boards. They'll ask you this question. How, how is, you know, what is the compensation? What, what is one of the main comp compensating mechanisms for, um, for a lumbar, uh, uh, for, for, for an in, for increased sagittal, sagittal plane abnormality. So basically, you know, and I'll talk about how this works because it's a little confusing, um, but as you increase the pelvic tilt, you reduce the SVA. SVA stands for uh, sagittal vertebral axis. This is the measure of how forward uh, the spine is. It's a line drawn from 
uh, a plumb line drop from the center of the C7 vertebrae um, down, and then the distance from the posterior superior point of the scran plate of the sacrum to that line. Um, so if you can imagine, just think of it, the spine is forward. If you're rotating the hips, if you're rotating the pelvis and the sacrum, looking at this picture, clockwise, for ease of just saying it, that's going to bring the spine posterior, reducing that SVA and keeping that center of gravity over the, uh, over the feet. Um, for this, targets have shown in, in less than 20 is normal. And then what is increased pelvic tilt? What is pelvic retroversion? People talk about this. Pelvic retroversion is basically the, is the compensatory mechanism. And this just means an increased, increasing your pelvic tilt to decrease that SVA. So as you rotate around, um, as, you, as, the, as the pelvis and the sacrum rotates um, posteriorly, it brings the spine back as well. And this is not well tolerated. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in, in, a, in a bit, but you know, it's something to watch out for. Finally, there's sacral slope, another positional parameter. This is very simple. It's just the slope of the pelvis, basically the angle between you know, a line drawn parallel to the uh, square end plate of S1 and a horizontal reference line. <clears throat> so what's the relationship between these parameters? So this is high yield. This is something you need to know. This is often asked on the boards. The pelvic incidence is the pelvic tilt plus the sacral slope. Um, this is a little more nuanced, but um, they do actually make up different proportions of the pelvic incidence. So they're not actually interchangeable. The sacral slope um, accounts for about 60% of the PI and the pelvic tilt accounts for about 40% of the PI <coughs> as a couple of studies have shown, including this one. But as one decrease, so but as as the, but they do change in in uh, via this equation. So that's kind of the general pelvic stuff. So the pelvis is kind of the foundation, um, and you know, you know, sagittal line is like building a house. People have said so. You know, you have the foundation, and then as you go up, these things all contribute. So we'll start with the lumbar spine and work up towards the cervical spine. So regional spinal alignment. We're just talking about cervical thoracic lumbar. These are important numbers to know you know, they're gonna vary widely between people um, and different conditions, but in general, you know, cervical lordosis, 14 degrees, something like that, thoracic kyphosis, 20 to 66 degrees, with the apex from T6 to T8, it depends where you actually measure it from, whether you're measuring from T1 or T4, as I'll talk about in a bit, and the lumbar lordosis, 20 to 80 degrees, matching the pelvic incidence, and the sacral kyphosis isn't really that, um, clinically relevant for us right now. So lumbar alignment, um, you know, there's been a lot, of, you know, everybody talks about lumbar alignment now and, and different ways to maintain and restore lumbar lordosis in a physiologic manner, producing the so-called a natural curve. What's important to know is, is that two thirds of the lumbar lordosis is found from L4 to S1. So when you're thinking about surgical strategies for increasing lordosis, if you need to, um, those are, that's where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. It's actually been shown also that proximal segmental lordosis correction is associated with proximal junctional kyphosis, <coughs> meaning that if you give all the lordosis at L12 or L23, you know, you may have issues with that. Um, also, you know, different studies have shown that very large corrections, lumbar lordosis, um, and SVA can increase the risk of PJK. You know, we worry about that in large deformity operations. Um, so it's important to consider all these things, um, when you're, when you're thinking about how much you need and also what you're going to do to get you there. Um, we can't talk about the lumbar lordosis without matching it with the, with the, with the pelvis. And this is a concept known as spinal pelvic harmony. Basically, you know, the, the, the line, and this is super high yield, definitely going to be on the boards, need to know it. The lumbar lordosis should be equal to the pelvic incidence plus or minus 10 degrees. Um, and here, this is a nice chart to kind of give a quick, and easy, a quick and easy overview of this. So somebody with a high PI, if you see right here, the sacrum is going to be more flat. It's going to be more horizontal. <coughs> As a result, the sacral slope is going to be high. And because of that increased PI, you're going to have a relatively increased lumbar lordosis to bring the spine posteriorly to keep the center of balance 
um, where it's supposed to be. Because of that, you may have also relatively higher thoracic kyphosis. <clears throat> and then oftentimes the lumbar lordosis in these cases, uh, the lumbar lordosis apex is a little more proximal, meaning because it's a bigger curve, it moves up a little bit. So the apex is usually around L3, L4. The low PI, a more vertical sacrum, um, you have a lower sacral slope, uh, obviously. Um, and then you need less lumbar lordosis to keep the spine in appropriate alignment. And, you know, as a result of that, less thoracic kyphosis. And because the curve itself <coughs> is uh, less significant and more gradual, the lumbar lordosis apex is going to be more distal around L5. But the main thing to understand here for the junior residents is that lumbar lordosis should match pelvic incidence plus or minus 10 degrees in most cases. The thoracic alignment, as I mentioned before, will change to compensate and, and, and or, or be different morphologically in order to match what's going on below. It's so usually between 20, 66 degrees, the apex is T6 and T8. Interestingly, because the thoracic spine is uh, much more rigid than the lumbar spine because of the rib cage. Um, in somebody who's unfused, you, the, uh, a larger thoracic kyphosis requires more lumbar lordosis to balance alignment like we just spoke about. In somebody with a fused uh, lumbar spine that's rigid, the thoracic spine, now that it's because it's, it's less rigid per se than the fused lumbar spine, may actually decrease the thoracic kyphosis a little bit as a compensatory mechanism if the lumbar lordosis is, is less. Cervical alignment, you, know, you could have an entire, an entire talk or course about cervical alignment and a lot of people do, so we're just gonna touch on it. The bottom line is that cervical alignment, it's not really foundational. It's more, uh, it, it provides more, it functions more mobility and allowing for uh, sustained horizontal gaze. Um, so one thing to look at and is an interesting thing with cervical alignment is the T1 slope. So the T1 slope is basically the analog of the sacral slope, but utilizing T1 instead of the sacrum. So as the T1 slope increases, <coughs> the cervical lordosis also has to increase just as in the lumbar spine um, to facilitate a horizontal gaze. This is very important to understand because um, it's been shown that up to 30% of the asymptomatic population has cervical kyphosis. And this isn't necessarily a deformity. This is just that that's morphologically how they are most ergonomic and doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be fixed. So those are kind of the three, you know, going up the spine. Um, we touched on the SVA. The SVA is a, is a measure of global spinal alignment. Um, it's, you know, it's dependent on the patient position, obviously, because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. And it's sensitive, and as a result, it's sensitive to all these compensatory mechanisms, including pelvic retroversion, which we'll touch on again. Um, it is, however, the most well-described. There's also a couple other measures that people talk about. More recently, the T1 pelvic angle which is attractive because it's not dependent on patient position um, and is independent as a result of compensatory mechanisms. And spinal pelvic inclination is basically the angular counterpart of the SVA. So SVA, I said before, it's a plumb line drawn from the center of the C7 body straight down and the distance, and it is the distance between the posterior superior point of S1 to this plumb line. So this varies with age, and I'll talk about the age-related changes in SVA uh, as we go forward. Um, but what's super important to understand is that this is correlated, you know, increased SVA is definitely correlated with disability, uh, and uh, it is altered by compensatory mechanisms. Um, so even though somebody has a normal SVA, you have to take their whole spine and their whole, you know, uh, alignment into account because they may just be compensating. They may actually have an issue. Uh, in general, the target has been less than five centimeters. Um, but again, this varies with age. So I'm gonna go back to this again, pelvic retroversion, because it's so important, um, an increased pelvic tilt. So if 
you imagine this in this picture, if you imagine this being rotated counterclockwise on this, on this, on this page, you know, the spine is going to be pulled posteriorly. That's what the pelvic tilt is doing. And it's generated down here. And as the, as the, you know, this, as, as this rotates around, it pulls you, pulls you back. That'll decrease the SVA, bring you into appropriate alignment, but this requires a lot of stress on the body's muscul musculoskeletal system and energy expenditure, and it is not well tolerated, as I'll show you. T1 pelvic angle, I, I mentioned, it's, you know, another a measure of global, uh, global alignment. It's unaffected um, by lower extremity or pelvic compensation, which is an attractive uh, uh, part of it. Um, you can measure it on prone radiographs as a result, even in the operating room. And, you know, in some papers it's that it is correlated with um, uh, patient outcomes and, and disability. The target for this is less than 14 degrees and more than 20 degrees corresponds to severe disability on ODI. This is not that high yield for the boards. It's kind of something that's, you know, uh, a lot of people are talking about in the literature now. SVA is definitely more important as far as our purposes. And then spinal pelvic inclination is this line here on the right side. Um, it's an angle drawn from the center of T1 to the uh, mid femoral head against a, a vertical reference. And, you know, it's the angular counterpart of SVA. Okay, so what is it all, what is, why does any of this really matter? So SV, we'll start with SVA. It's probably the most well-studied parameter and it's strongly correlated with patient outcomes on multiple scales. Um, it's been shown that with patients with increased SVA, the kyphotic deformity of the lumbar spine has the greatest impact on the ODI. Thinking about that, that, that seems pretty straightforward. Um, but overall, we have to remember that SVA, a positive SVLO isn't a reliable predictor of symptoms, i.e. the elderly, because they can actually tolerate a higher degree of SVA. Um, and if you're doing a deformity operation for somebody with increased sagittal, uh, uh, with, with a sagittal malalignment, not taking compensatory mechanisms into account can lead to undercorrection of the alignment um, in deformity operations, which leads to a, a bigger problem. Um, in general, the surgical alignment objective is less than five centimeters. However, again, it's based on variable based on the age and what people can tolerate. Um, T1 pelvic angle, I touched on this before more than greater than 20 degrees corresponds to severe disability by ODI. Um, pelvic incidence, this is more high yield um, for the residents. You really need to recognize that patients with a, well, spinal pelvic mismatch is, is a big deal. Basically a high PI with a low lumbar lower dosis. This is associated with increased disability. That's definitely on your boards. Um, and as a result, these compensatory mechanisms come into play, including increased pelvic tilt, and decreased thoracic kyphosis is also possible. You have a picture here of a patient who looks like kind of has this kind of flat butt. That's a result of the increased pelvic tilt trying to bring the spine back. Um, as a result, you can also see that the hips are somewhat flexed, as are the knees, as this person tries to bring himself back. And this is not, just looking at it, you know that this is not an ergonomic position for this person to be in. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, is to recognize that patients with a higher PI are at increased risk um, for development of six at, uh, fixed sagittal balance after fusion surgery. Um, you don't want to lose any uh, lordosis, um, and and these patients who have a higher need a higher lordosis to begin with, you know, there's there's more to lose. So you have to keep that in keep that in mind. Um, pelvic tilt. We just talked about it. Um, an unrecognized high pelvic tilt can lead to an underestimation of the true sagittal malalignment via pelvic retroversion as a compensatory mechanism. Um, and oftentimes, if you have somebody who's you know coming to see you in the clinic with surgery someplace else or or whatever, uh, a high pelvic tilt often indicate, indicates that you know the generation of lumbar lordosis had been inadequate. And pelvic retroversion is not well tolerated and is associated with poor outcome measures. Um, which has been shown um, in multiple studies. Um, here's one um, out of HSS looking at, you know, these different uh, pelvic tilt and trunk and inclination and, and how these different things, uh, whether compensated or not compensated, match up to um, patient outcomes on these different measures. The most important thing to see here is that uh, the purple <clears throat> is a high pelvic tilt um, with a low SVA. That means that um, this is a fully compensated, somebody with a sagittal malalignment who is fully compensated um, 
look at the difference between the ODI score, particularly when ambulating um, from someone who's normal, low PT, low SVA, compared to just the compensatory mechanism, it increases significantly. That's the main thing from here. Um, and then, you know, and we talk, I talked about this already, you know, pelvic reversion requires increased energy utilization, causes a crouched gait, can lead to hip flexion contractures, and then these abnormal, uh, 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 these, these, these abnormal, uh, the rotated uh, hips and internal rotated deeds, which is not, none of this is ergonomic. So this causes increased stress to the body and is not well to tolerated, particularly when upright or when ambulating. So that being said, we'll talk a little bit about age and what happens. So, you know, a lot of this is just attributed to gravity and time. So over time, um, there's a loss of lumbar lordosis, which results in increased positive sagittal balance and an increased thoracic kyphosis. Um, which also increases the SVA. As a result, you see that the PILL difference does uh, increase. And then there's a bunch of other changes as well, including loss of muscle mass, loss of function, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, and various neurological changes that also occur uh, in, the aging, in the aging person. But is that significant is the question. Does everybody, does every like 90-year-old lady need a you know, T4 to pelvis? And the answer is definitely no. Um, so, and then, yeah, this is just what I'm saying, you know, through these different mechanisms, you know, they may not, they don't really need correction to what's generally accepted as normal values. And this is a nice study from ISSG that was the first basically to look at the ideal spinal pelvic parameters, um, and, and actually, uh, surgical targets, um, for elderly patients specifically. So we touched on this established thre thresholds. SVA less than five, PILL plus or minus 10, pelvic tilt less than 20. Looking at somebody who's over 75 years old, these are normative, these are, they, they got these numbers basically through uh, regression analysis um, correlated with, with uh, normative values and, 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 and disability scores to find the appropriate targets for patients who are you know, uh, doing well. So in, uh, over 75, SVA almost eight centimeters is well tolerated. Um, PILL 16.7, PT 20.5. So <clears throat> the bottom line is that older patients can tolerate significantly more positive sagittal uh, alignment um, as well as mismatch and pelvic tilt. So we don't have to be as aggressive um, and may not need anything at all. Obviously here in somebody under 35, these result, these numbers are, are lower. And then our established thresholds <coughs> are someplace in the middle. So what do we need to look at when we're, when we're looking at, uh, how do we evaluate, you know, these, these patients and why is it important? I mean, it's, it's very important, you know, in 2019, uh, this analysis of the national patient sample from 2004, 2015 looked at, you know, the volume and the increases in granular uh, data for, you know, lumbar fusions found that elective lumbar fusions increased 62%, which is a huge number. And the greatest proportional increase was seen for adult spinal deformity, 186% um, increase. Um, and moreover that almost 140% increase in the surgery and volume of, uh, in the surgical volume for those age 65 and older. I mean, this is, you know, it's obvious we see it here, you know, patients are, healthier as we're older. Um, they're seeking more pain. They're more active. They're seeking advanced spine care. And we have multiple ways of doing it in, you know, traditional open ways, but also minimally invasive ways to minimize morbidity, mor morbidity and comfortably uh, advise and, and offer different surgical options for these patients who in the past <coughs> may not have been considered good surgical candidates. Oops. So you know, this is the, the basics here. So radiographic evaluation. I mean, if you're concerned for someone uh, having a, a, you know, a sagittal malalignment and causing their symptoms, you know, probably the most important thing you're going to need are upright AP and lateral 36 inch films. Um, you need these to evaluate all the spinal pelvic parameters. You can't do this on a, uh, on a CT scan or an MRI because those, you know, most of those parameters are positional and are not going to be valuable. But there is value in looking at the, the CT and MRI. Obviously, 
you look at the integrity for bony anatomy on the CT, the MRI for neurologic compression. But you know, a nice cheat code here is basically to look at the scout film um, of the CT scan or the uh, or pay attention to what the alignment looks like in the MRI or CT to kind of evaluate how flexible a deformity is if they have one. And that's really important to know because it, it will dictate what you need to do to that person to bring them maybe to that alignment, how they are when they're supine, but you need that when they're upright. And then obviously flexion extension films are useful for instability. <laughs> now, when you're seeing them, the most important thing, aside from the imaging studies, actually more important than any of the imaging studies is their history and physical examination. I mean, this is, this is where it all, this is where it all starts. Um, and there's some subtleties here. I mean, it's a, with these patients, it's important to evaluate posture and gait, um, presence of hip flexion contractures, things like this. But it's important to understand, you know, why they're coming to see you. <clears throat> if somebody just has radiculopathy, but they also happen to have like a positive SDA, you know, it, you know, it's not that they have, it's probably not that they have some giant deformity needs fixing, but that they have a uh, nerve root irritation from a disc and may just need a microdiscectomy. <laughs> Um, so it's important to watch out for the symptoms. So what are symptoms of sagittal imbalance? So an inability to stand upright um, is, is the main one. Uh, back pain with prolonged standing and ambulation. This is different than just straight up, you know, oh, I, my, you know, I have some, some back pain when I'm doing some stuff. It's, it, it's, it's, it's subtle, but it's different. Um, it's dif and, it's, and it's very important to kind of decide between the two. Fatigue with activity resulting in increased pain. Um, pain that's relieved by recumbency, meaning you're unloading the spine. Spine gets unloaded and, 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 and things get better. And then also, you know, these patients can have pain all over in the thighs and the legs as a result of compensatory mechanisms as well. But then they can also present with more typical degenerative symptoms like neurogenic claudication, radiculopathy, and myelopathy, which you also have to tease out. But the main one I think is, you know, to evaluate really is an inability to stand upright for a prolonged period of time. And then also just looking at them um, in the supine position, the standing position and the sitting position. In supine position, you can differentiate fixed from flexible sagittal deformities. They can't lie their head down when they're lying supine. You know, it's more fixed. Um, you want to evaluate them for rib hump deformities, which could indicate a rotational deformity like you see in this picture right here. Um, but that's, and, uh, and also, you know, just want to look at their, their overall, how they appear from an ergonomic point of view when they're just standing, walking, and if you can identify any of these compensatory mechanisms. Some things you'll see, you can see increased cervical lordosis in order to keep the gaze horizontal as they're falling forward. Um, a decreased thoracic kyphosis, um, possibly because of decreased lumbar lordosis, um, a crouched posture that is a result of this pelvic retroversion, um, and then hip and knee uh, uh, flexion, uh, and uh, hip, hip flexion and, and knee flexion as well. The Thomas test is one thing you can do in the clinic. Um, I don't think this is super high yield for the boards, um, but can help to determine uh, if the patient has hip flexion contractures or even just tight hip flexors at all, basically you have the patient lie on a lie supine on a bed and bring one knee forward. And if the uh, contralateral uh, knee is not able to fall flat and is elevated off the bed, um, then you know that you know that there is tightness in the in the hip flexors. Okay, and then the last thing we're going to kind of touch on a bit here is methods to restore and maintain sagittal alignment. So, you know, what are we? What are the what are the goals here? So, when you're thinking about doing a fusion surgery on somebody, you should always at least consider um, alignment and at least maintaining their lumbar lordosis um, and not not losing anything. And so, surgical techniques can vary greatly with regard to how much lordosis can be achieved. Um, and, 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 uh, or, or lost really. So inner body fusions are a great option. Um, you know, there's circumferential access to the spine. The one we're most common, one we're most comfortable with is the T-lift obviously done in the prone position. Uh, there are expandable options in order to provide increased lordosis, um, coming from a lateral approach, 
uh, you know, we have the ability to, do, to use hyperlordotic cages, um, increased fusion rates, and also the ability to do an ACR, meaning an anterior, uh, uh, anterior column resection, re re resecting the, the anterior longitudinal ligament and allowing for much increased uh, lordosis. Um, a lift from the front is a great option from L3 to S1, although, you know, the more proximal you go, the more, the more tricky it can be. So typically we do 5-1 or even four or five, I've seen a couple of times doing uh, L3, four down to S1, uh, but it's definitely not the norm. Um, and then OLIF uh, is a more anterolateral approach that allows expanded access basically from L1 to S1. Osteotomies are, are very important and I'll just kind of quickly go over what the different things are, what we do, um, because this is important for the junior just to know in general when you're going in on your spine rotation. Um, <clears throat> what you're going to do depends on a couple things. What the flexibility of the spine, how much sagittal correction do you really need, and the number of levels over which you have to achieve it. So this is the, you know, Frank Schwab came out with his classification for spinal osteotomies. Um, it's a good framework for which to just kind of uh, understand, you know, the different ones in your mind. Um, a grade one osteotomy basically a partial facet joint resection. This would be the equivalent of just taking off the, uh, the IAPs, um, you know, in the thoracic or, or the lumbar spine. And we typically, you know, we've done that a lot. Um, that's basically you, you make a cut, you know, uh, across the pars and also uh, craniocaudally south down to the intrathoracic lamina. And you can take that IAP right off it's in the lumbar spine. Um, and a little bit different than thoracic spine. But that's, that's one thing you can do. And this will mobilize the spine a bit. A grade two osteotomy would be a complete facet joint resection. This means taking the IP and then doing a, probably doing a laminectomy there and also removing the SAP and the intervening ligamentum flavum. You can imagine how this would allow even more uh, ability to kind of, kind of clamp down and allow a little bit more lordosis. Where is that? And you can see here actually, um, on this picture, they've taken the uh, SAP here. It's been taken off as well as what it looks like the, I, the IAP as well. And you can imagine that when you have your inner body there and you have your screws in, you have this open space here. So you're shortening the posterior column um, and that will allow for increased lordosis. And you can emphasize that by compressing the screws or doing different things or just relying on passive lordosis from the Jackson table. A grade three osteotomy is basically a pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Um, basically, you're resecting the the uh, you know the, the facets as well as bilateral pedicles and a wedge resection uh, into your, into the posterior vertebral body, which allows even more space for the uh, bone to collapse on itself and generate even more uh, lordosis. A grade four osteotomy is what's commonly called a uh, an extended pedicle subtraction osteotomy. This is just a wider wedge resection that also includes uh, the um, uh, a portion of uh, the end plate and adjacent uh, uh, disc. So again, just increasing the ability to clamp down. Grade five, we don't typically see a lot of. It's basically a VCR or vertebral column resection, basically removing the entire the entire vertebral body. Um, and then grade six. Um, would be multiple vertebrectomies. Obviously, as you go down the line here, the, uh, the morbidity um, clearly increases, um, what, but what can you get? So from grade one, grade two, you can expect, you know, five at max 10 degrees um, of lordosis per level, uh, maximized if you compress, um, compress the screws. For a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, you're looking at, you know, 30, 40 degrees, depending on how much of a red wedge resection you do, and even more for these for these vertebral uh, vertebrectomies. Um, of note, if you're doing something like an ALL release, you can get basically just as much uh, lordosis correction as you would with a pedicle subtraction osteotomy, um, <clears throat> but um, with probably a lot less blood loss um, and, and hopefully decreased morbidity. Obviously, there's different indications for either um, for a, you know, a pedicle subtraction osteotomy is going to be more indicated in somebody who has a fixed sagittal plane malalignment or already has a fused spine. 
um, because you know it wouldn't matter to take the ALL. You need still need to because it's not mobile. So that's usually for a fixed spine. I mentioned this. You know the pedicle screws. You can compress. You know you got to be careful um, with patients who have poor bone quality um, because you could uh, damage the the integrity of the screws by doing this too much. Um, it's important to understand that when you put somebody on a Jackson table, you are going to allow for a passive amount of lordosis to be, uh, to be produced. And, uh, and that may be enough. And then finally, you know, we'll talk uh, considerations for the elderly, you know, is MIS a good option? I mean, I, I, and I think it is, I mean, Dr. Cantor, um, did this, uh, systematic review of 40 articles looking at, um, MIS uh, uh, correction for coronal and sagittal plane deformity in an elderly population <clears throat> and found that it is effective um, in the correction of coronal plane and also moderate sagittal plane deformity um, with a decreased incidence of PJK compared to open, but an increased risk of pseudoarthrosis. Um, but this might be a good balance between minimizing morbidity and, uh, and less uh, rigorous target parameters. This is a really nice uh, algorithm that was produced by ISSG, including Dr. Wang um, for minimal invasive spine surgery deformity algorithm. Um, you know, looking at this, you know, they, uh, what they found was basically there's certain things that are associated with treatment failure and MIS deformity surgery. So an SVA greater than six, a PT greater than 25, a PILL mismatch greater than 30, and a coronal Cobb angle greater than 20. So, you know, severe deformities that need a lot of correction are oftentimes uh, still best managed um, with open surgery <coughs> and possible extension to the thoracic spine. This would be like your T10 to the pelvis or something like that. But for patients that don't need a lot and really don't have much of a deformity, you can potentially do MIS surgery with a decompression alone. Um, versus a fusion if there's a spondylolisthesis. <clears throat> and then there's the in-between as well. Um, and this is often more times for coronal deformity, but this is a nice thing to look at and just kind of think about a little bit and can be applied to, um, can be applied to patients. So overall, I mean, I wanted to do this talk to just kind of give the, the, the basically the, the PGY1s, PGY3s, a little uh, summary of uh, you know, things we talk about in spine that maybe they don't hear too often, um, and to at least start to begin to understand, you know, what alignment is, um, so then they can then move on to understanding what's actually important. Um, you know, it's important to look at this stuff so we can maximize our patient outcomes, avoid iatrogenic fixed sagittal imbalance, um, and the morbidity that falls with that, which can be quite high and also to minimize the risks of adjacent segment disease and PJK. At the, end of, at the end of the day, treatment for each patient needs to be highly individualized. Not every patient, and actually the minority of patients, need a deformity operation. But even so, we should still consider alignment when we're doing, when we're doing spine surgery, uh, especially fusion surgery. And then, you know, like I said, like at least five questions um, from the boards in the past couple of years have come like directly off this. So I'll send this to the, I'll send this out to the residents so they can look at, um, as they want to do some quick, quick and dirty spine review before next Friday, bunch of references and that's it. Thank you guys. So, um, big treat to this morning, everyone. We have Dr. Eva Wittestam Noga. Uh, she's a professor in neurological surgery, surgery, a very important, a component of the Miami Project Cure Paralysis. Everyone knows that neuropathic pain is a major quality of life issue in people living with um, spinal cord injury. And so Eva today is going to talk about her uh, transdisciplinary perspective on pain after spinal cord injury. Dr. Noga, thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, chronic pain after spinal cord injury. It's something that I've focused on for most of my career, actually. And chronic pain in general is really one of the most underestimated healthcare problems today. And um, it has a great impact on people's lives, negative. And um, 
that's going to be the focus of this talk. So, so what is pain? Well, it's defined by, by the International Association for the Study of Pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience from actual or potential tissue damage. That was actually um, a result of a consensus meeting in 1971, I guess. And I still, I think it still is a valid definition of pain. So what makes a person's pain um, personal? So the experience is personal. And that is because it's dependent on so many different things. So for example, it depends on the type of pain you have. Um, what does it feel like? Is it constant? Is it intermittent? Um, does your pain hinder your activities? And of course, for spinal cord injury, it's very much about independence. Does it affect your ability to be an independent individual? Mood can be also be affected and sleep is commonly affected by chronic pain. There are also a number of emotional uh, components that are very common in chronic pain, people with chronic pain. Uh, and that's, for example, depression, anxiety, PTSD are some of the most common. Um, and then, of course, it depends on is the pain manageable? Can it be reduced? Um, and that is something that is difficult then for people with spinal cord injury who have neuropathic pain, because that pain is pretty much um, permanent, although it can be reduced. So uh, we're going to get to that a little bit. So then, of course, an individual with spinal cord injury who has pain, uh, they also have all the other aspects of spinal cord injury that they have to deal with. So, uh, so the extra burden that's caused by, especially those ones who have severe neuropathic pain, can be very debilitating. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the research focus, I realized a couple of days ago that I have actually been here 25 years, and that's, that's a really long time. Um, and I started thinking about what kind of steps we've taken and previously and where we're going and what we're doing right now. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of that. So in the beginning, of course, we, 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 I've been involved and still am involved in a lot of standardizations of pain assessment and the international guidelines for that. Um, and just some examples are the basic and extended spinal cord injury pain data sets, um, pain classification, taxonomy and diagnostic of general chronic pain and central neuropathic pain. And we also validated a lot of assessments in spinal cord injury so that we can use them. Because of course, if you have a measure that's been used in, we say diabetic neuropathy, it may not fit in spinal cord injury. So we've done a lot of work on that over the, work, over the years, me and my colleagues. And then also an interest has been to, to look also at the multidimensional pain profiles. So that, that is concerning more, more psychological variables, how people deal with their pain, what kind of impact it has on, on their pain. Um, and then of course, we're very interested in the underlying mechanisms, whatever we can assess in people. So one of the ways one can do it is looking at phenotyping, and I'll show you a little bit about that. And that's basically subgrouping people and hoping that subgroups will respond differently to different uh, approaches. And one can do that using pain science, like sensory assessments. One can use it with uh, using pain symptom severity. Um, we have done some brain imaging too with magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Um, and we also have some neurocognitive measures that we have uh, used in our research. So then we come to more of a current um, research. Of course, we're continuing with all of this, uh, but um, we also have, I, I got very interested in a few years now to hear from people with spinal cord injuries, what their perspectives were on what it was like to have spinal cord injury, what they perceived to be the biggest uh, barriers to having uh, optimal pain management. Um, 
And out of that, um, we developed the pain education because it showed that people with spinal cord injury didn't really have uh, a lot of information regarding pain. They had a lot of information about other things, other associated consequences of SCI, but not about pain. Um, so that's one of the things that's ongoing. I'll show you a little bit about that. Uh, and also, um, right now, we have a grant that we'll also talk a little bit about that's testing of non-pharmacological uh, approaches. So if we just look just the basics here of, of uh, pain classification. Uh, so, so until I would say this 2012, there were like four different ways to classify pain and it caused a lot of confusion in the field. So, um, so what we did as a group uh, was to actually merge the previously published taxonomies uh, to, to come up with a sort of mutual or standardized version. Um, and the difference between this taxonomy and perhaps other pain classifications in other populations is that this include all the pains that people have. So it can actually include pain that is not related to spinal cord injury itself. And the reason for that is that often the pains in these populations are managed by physiatry. And they then deal with all the pains, not just the ones that are related directly to spinal cord injury. And of course, it's important with the classification because it does have implications for treatments. So I'm just not going to go into this in any detail, but you can see here that at first, the broad type, it's really two types of pains. It's either nociceptive or neuropathic pain. Um, nociceptive pain can be musculoskeletal. It can be visceral, could be caused by something in the viscera, or it could be other. And that is because we wanted to include other types of pain in this. And that could be pain due to pressure sores, to, to something else that is not related directly to spinal cord injury. Um, and the neuropathic pain is primarily at level or below level. That's related to spinal cord injury itself. Uh, and then other pain could be other neuropathic pain that a person can have that anybody can have, like a neuropathic diabetic a neuropathy or something like that. Um, other pain is really um, pain that we know the name of, but not necessarily the mechanism in any detail. Uh, unknown pain is when we don't know what it is, but it's usually the first two categories. You can usually fit in most pains in that. It's very rare that, that you don't know what it is. So if we just look at one of the few uh, longitudinal studies that have been done in spinal cord injuries, very few actually, that have looked at the development of pain after injury or early after injury. So you can see here, this is a study from Denmark uh, and they actually used this taxonomy to actually um, differentiate when different pains started and, and um, how they evolved over time in, in a group that was not large, but it still is a moderate sample size. Uh, and you can see there that any kind of pain is pretty constant. It's about 80% of people have some kind of pain uh, up to a year after injury. Uh, and uh, the neuropathic pain increases, and it's primarily the below-level neuropathic pain that increases over time in prevalence. Um, and if, if it increases below, or I would say after a year, then a person should be examined for any other causes of pain. It could be a syringe developing or something like that, because usually the below level of neuropathic pain evolves over the first year. Um, whereas we can say here that the musculoskeletal pain uh, can actually evolve much later due to uh, overuse, for example, due to wheelchair use. So what does it feel like? Well, it feels very different to different people. And these quotes you see here, these are verbatim quotes from people that we've interviewed. Um, and there's a lot of variation. Some people feel, you see here, one is, for example, 
it feels as if you have your legs put in a massive vice grip and you're constantly squeezing. It's a very hard throbbing, squeezing pain constantly all day, all night. So that's one of the descriptions. Um, common words used, pins and needles, painful cold, burning, tingling, numbness, electric shocks are common words from our own database. Other words, pricking, sharp, stabbing, shooting, lacerating, squeezing, and aching. So we have a lot of descriptions of, of these pains. And temperature usually affects the pain. So that's why we see people coming here in the, um, when it's winter in other places, they come to Florida because pain gets better when they're here. So there are, of course, a number of mechanisms that contribute to neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury. Uh, and of course, they're not completely understood. Um, so it makes it very difficult to determine the cause of pain and the best treatment. And I'll just show some of the, some of the mechanisms that have been discussed most. Of course, there is a lot of potential mechanisms. One of the most common discussed is central sensitization. And that is when the, the nervous system is, is very, is facilitating or um, um, it's sensitized in, at different levels. And this can then be displayed clinically as hyperalgesia, which basically means that it's an exaggerated response. If you do a pin prick, for example, it will be very, very strong pain from that, whereas normally it would be a very mild pain. Um, it could be allodynia, which is a, which is a uh, stimulus that is not normally painful, but can feel painful. A very common example of that is a dynamic mechanical allodynia. When you brush, for example, with a brush on the skin, then that feels very uncomfortable and painful. Another mechanism is reduced, of in, reduced inhibition of pain signals. We do have endogenous pain modulatory systems in our bodies that are normally active as soon as they're needed. And they are not necessarily fully functional in, in spinal cord injury. So, so, so therefore it's almost like we say here, like a break, it's, it's a break on the pain. And when that's not working, then the pain signals just enter the brain and we become, it becomes very, uncomfortable and painful. We also have microglial activation changes to support cells. And that's also a common mechanism. And they cause uh, basically inflammation or release infl inflammatory factors that can increase the pain and making the neurons um, hypersensitive. We also have maladaptive neuroplasticity, which is another mechanism, uh, which is, um, of course, particularly uh, interesting in spinal cord injury uh, because of the potential for, we do want some neuro uh, regeneration, for example. So, so, so that's, why I am involved in some of the studies that are focusing on regeneration to assess pain, to see if pain is affected in any way, in a negative way or any, any positive way. So, so, so that's another thing that there could be other connections that increase pain or cause pain. So, so in summary, this is very uh, superficial, but in summary, both spinal cord and injury and, and the brain can become very hypersensitive, hyperactive, and reorganized. And the, all these changes can cause pain. And the problem is that we don't know in which patients it is the primary mechanism or all of them. So I just wanted to share a little bit with you to the latest um, recommendations for treatments of neuropathic pain after spinal cord injury. And this, this is evidence-based. So the evidence base is actually pretty small for pain in spinal cord injury. And that is 
because we have, it's difficult to do a pharmacological trial in spinal cord injury and to get the right size of um, sample size. So we can, for example, get an example from um, uh, the study on pregabalin, which actually shows that one person in seven, the numbers needed to treat, will have a 30% pain relief. And that's the best treatment that we have pharmacologically. So, so it's not that great, actually. So even if the first line here of, med of, of the medications are pregabalin and gabapentin, the evidence base is relatively weak. Well, not, I wouldn't say it's weak, but it, it uh, is not working in everyone, that's for sure. Um, then another alternative there is amitriptyline, which is then, of course, targeting the uh, improving the endogenous pain modulatory systems, uh, whereas pregabalin and gabapentin are targeting more the hyperextability. Um, then we have B options, and that's the B options are uh, because they are um, not as much, there's not as strong evidence base for them. Um, that's also primarily um, primarily um, anticonvulsants. And then the C options, they can be considered. And then you have transcutaneous or transcranial direct current stimulation and the combined transcurrent direct current stimulation and visual illusion. Uh, and actually that's, we're doing that in the pilot study right now, actually. Uh, where we're looking a little bit at the mechanism, what's happening during that kind of uh, treatment. And, and I can say that out of the few people that we have had so far, of course, it's severely inhibited by the pandemic. So far, hopefully, we're going to get back on track there. Uh, but those people who have tested it, all of them have a reduction in pain. So I thought that was rather encouraging. Um, and then, of course, we have D options, TENS, oxycodone, cannabinoids, and DRESS is, of course, something that is not um, a first-line a first line treatment, but actually uh, in very rare cases. So this is a, a Canadian pain clinical guidelines, um, and uh, it also cons includes people from the US. So it's not just Canadian, even though it's called Canadian, there's some US doctors in there too. Um, another thing that they added this time, which I thought was very nice, was that there was a strong uh, encouragement for self-management strategies that they can then do in addition, addition to other treatments. Um, and it should be encouraged in the clinical management. Um, and also a comprehensive pain management strategy should address issues that have to do with activity inhibition, maybe, um, or interference with activity, sleep, mood. Um, and also it could include then both pharmacological and non-pharmacological strategies where it's appropriate. And uh, they also emphasized, which of course for me is uh, particularly interesting, uh, is a program that consists of patient education, cognitive behavioral therapy, self-management, group discussions, exercise or guided relaxations. That could then be combined with other things. So, um, so we know that persistent neuropathic pain is common after SCI. And despite that we have treatments that work in other populations, it's not properly managed. And we know that there are multiple pathophysiological and psychological factors that are responsible for the origin and maintenance of pain. And the most rational approach is to identify the pain generating mechanisms and tailor interventions to these. And that sounds very logical and nice, but it's very difficult to do that. So, of course, since we don't know exactly which mechanism is um, most uh, important in each individual, then people are usually trying different treatments and see which one works the best. Um, so, 
One approach that has been suggested by a number of people is to actually look at phenotypes or subgroups and try to, to provide uh, groupings of symptoms and other factors um, that could give some kind of guideline or, or some kind of hint to what kind of treatment would work best in those individuals. Because of course, every time you try a treatment and it doesn't work, it creates a certain bias and also a certain uh, expectation that may affect future treatments. So some of the, the things that we have worked on and other people have worked on over the years is to look at somatosensory uh, phenotypes, including QST. So there are some defined phenotypes. One is a mixed thermal and a mechanical sensory loss. One is with residual temperature perception and pain sensation. That's something we have seen in our studies and others. Um, Dynamic mechanical allodynia is one phenotype potential. Thermal allodynia is another one, mechanical. Decreased pain modulation is something that people have looked at as a phenotype. And then, of course, you could target that kind of phenotype to uh, something that will, like an amitriptyline or, or something like that. So quantitative sensory testing has then been suggested or promoted as a way to actually do this phenotyping. Um, and um, I don't think we need to say much more about that, but we'll continue here. So what we do with the uh, QST, which we call it quantitative sensory testing, is that we test thermal uh, thresholds. And we use this little electrode. We actually have a different one right now that we're using, but this is the one we used for many years. Um, and you put this thermal on the skin and the person reports when they feel uh, either cool or warm sensation or cold pain and pain and hot pain sensation. We also test um, um, vibration as a measure of a dorsal column function. Um, and that's something we used for many years too. And uh, it's the same principle. You just put it on the skin and, and the different sites. Um, and the sites you, you can either test in the painful areas or you can test in, in, uh, in standardized areas. So one of the study we did now a, a few years back was to see if we can find multidimensional neuropathic pain phenotypes where we used QST, pain intensity, and catastrophizing coping strategies. And catastrophizing we included because that's one of those factors that we know is particularly associated with, with poor outcomes or, or more severe pain. And we assessed thermal uh, per perception, thermal pain, and vibratory perception above and below the level of injury in 101 people with SCI and neuropathic pain, 18 people with SCI and no neuropathic pain, and 50 able bodied pain free controls. So, as you can see, it's difficult to find people who don't have pain. It's actually more difficult than one would think. So we did a cluster analysis of these assessments. And this, this uh, schematic figure here is really showing which, uh, which of the variables contributed most to actually uh, provide the subgroups. And you can see the hot pain uh, threshold was the one that, that actually contributed most. And then average pain intensity. Um, cool detection, cold pain, catastrophizing, and warm detection. And um, so we got two different phenotypes, one with greater pain intensity and thermal and vibratory sensitivity compared to moderate neuropathic pain. And we can see here when we compare them on something that was not part of the, the cluster analysis, you can see that the, the more severe pain has more severe burning pain, pressing pain, paroxysmal pain, and paresthesia and dysesthesia. Um, 
and but not really any difference in evoked pain. And that could be because this particular questionnaire is actually um, has a 24 hour window and not always do you have evoked pain every day. So it could be a result of that. If we look at the QST, we can then see that the darker columns here, which is the severe neuropathic pain, they actually have most sparing of the spinothalamic functions and also the dorsal column functions. And we thought that was, that was a little, um, it, it fits with the, with the basic research, but some of the other research suggests that, that the more injury you have to the spinothalamic tract functions, the more pain you have, but we didn't see that. We, we, we saw that uh, people with, with uh, neuropathic pain were actually more closer to normal thresholds. And that could then be due to that there is fewer, uh, fewer neurons or fewer pathways going up. So there's injury to the spinal thalamic tract relative to, to, nor to normative, but there's also amplification somewhere. So, so we've found in our research that there's a difference between severe pain and moderate pain or severe pain and mild pain. And it's probably that there are some additional mechanistic underpinnings for severe pain compared to just having pain. Um, and just to explain here, perhaps what this shows, we always standardize our assessments. So anything that is on the lower, lower um, below zero here relative to able-bodied controls is actually um, a loss of function. So I just wanted to show you a little bit to how people have used neuropathic pain phenotypes in clinical trials, because that's the ultimate goal for the research part, is that you can take, you can study uh, the phenotypes and you can then test them in the clinical trial and see how they respond to a specific treatment and then kind of deduce the, what the mechanism could be. So if we look at the first one here, that's peripheral neuropathic pain. And they defined uh, one group as having irritable nociceptor, <clears throat> which means that there was preserved cold, warm pinprick and hyperalgesia. Uh, and then they had the deaffrontation, which was greater sensory loss across multiple modalities. Um, we look at that, we can see that the sodium channel blocker, uh, oxacarbazepine, I can't pronounce it really well, um, is uh, numbers needed to treat is 3.9, whereas the same drug in the deaffrontation group is 13 numbers needed to treat. So that means that people in the irritable nociceptor group responded much better to, to the treatment. And therefore one could say that perhaps the mechanisms are primarily upregulation of sodium channels. So that's how it has been used in, in studies to sort of try to understand mechanistic uh, underpinnings in, in human subjects. Um, when it comes to spinal cord injury, there was a study here where they looked at evoked pain and no evoked pain. And the evoked pain, uh, they tested pregabalin and oxacarbazepine, uh, and they found that, that uh, for non-evoked pain, they had a better effect of um, uh, oxacarbazepine for electric and burning and pricking pain. Uh, and pregabalin was better for burning pain. And therefore they, they thought that there would perhaps be upregulation of sodium channel for that non-evoked pain. So there are very few studies looking at these things uh, because of, of, for spinal cord injury, because it is, you can see the sample sizes are relatively small. Um, when it comes to diabetic neuropathy, on the other hand, clinical trials usually can recruit several hundred people. So there they have a really good opportunity to look at phenotyping. And in this particular study, they used uh, a questionnaire called the Neuropathic Pain Symptom Inventory that we have used and validated in spinal cord injury. Um, and they found that 
in the cluster, um, in the cluster two and three, which actually, if we look at the, the numbers here, there's, that's more moderate pain than cluster one that is more severe. Almost all the different pain symptoms there are in the severe range. Whereas in the cluster two and cluster three is less severe. And they found that duloxetine was much better than pregabalin as a monotherapy. So they concluded that perhaps in those groups who had more moderate pain, duloxetine uh, may indicate that it was an impaired descending pain modulation. I would say that these studies are just, um, um, I would say they are relatively preliminary um, despite the, the sample sizes. And of course, you can see it's not like a, a definite that if you have this, then you need this treatment. But I think this is where the field wants to move and try to do more, to use a, um, a buzzword now, precision medicine. So then I'm going to move into a little bit about our qualitative research where we have actually looked at barriers and facilitators. Um, to optimal pain management. Um, and um, this was a, a qualitative uh, study, uh, which means that it's open-ended interviews and it's a thematic coding of what people tell us. You cannot ask, you don't want the answer yes or no or a specific rating. You want people to really talk about what it's like and, and what they think is important. And then you basically thematically code it. And those things that come up more frequently are with bigger font here. So one of the biggest uh, barrier for people with spinal cord injury was medication concerns. They were worried about addiction, adverse effects, and it didn't feel like it was worth taking medication because of there were more side effects and benefits. <clears throat> they also felt like it was uh, inadequate access to information and expertise. There was limited information regarding pain. They didn't feel like their healthcare providers had a lot of expertise. And of course, if you have a healthcare provider who has maybe one or two people with spinal cord injury patients, they are maybe not as knowledgeable as someone who is at the big spinal cord injury center where people see daily patients with spinal cord injury pain. So I think that's understandable. I mean, this reached uh, not only people associated with our center. So uh, facilitators that people were very interested in was non-pharmacological options. And they mentioned a lot of things that they did themselves, self-management, and also things that they, they wanted. They also wanted to better understand and communicate about pain. They felt their communication with their physicians um, were not good. Um, there was also a lot of, of resilience, I would say, in this population, uh, which is very inspiring. It makes you never want to complain about anything at all because there's a lot of resilience despite everything that people with spinal cord injury have to deal with. They're very resilient. So that was a thing that helped people a lot. Uh, some people used obviously pharmacological options uh, and also social support was important. Uh, we also interviewed uh, significant other and family members. They had very similar concerns and, and also perspectives as their uh, family member. So I would say that it's very similar on that. Um, but they, you can see some of the quotes here, like nobody really discussed pain or what to expect. We have never had any of these discussions with the doctors. So, so it seems like pain is an area that is not really um, uh, discussed very frequently. Um, and they also felt like they had to they had to become experts so that they could help. So um, with the healthcare provider perspectives, um, 
healthcare providers thought it was a very difficult problem. So the biggest issue for them was actually the barrier of insurance and cost that they felt like they have access to the physician, um, but they don't really have access. Uh, they need access to everything else that the physicians recommend. And they didn't feel like they had that. They also felt like there was inadequate uh, time for patient education, limited patient access to specialized spinal cord injury care, and limited evidence base for treatment options, which is all true. Uh, they also felt like their patients were resistant to suggestions in changes. Um, and social, support, social environment um, could be a barrier that would be either lack of social support or a social support that was too much focused on pain. Uh, they perceived that one of the most uh, beneficial or best facilitators for them managing pain the best was to have an effective patient communication so that they could discuss different options. They also wanted interdisciplinary care so that they could have a team approach to patient care and also having access to colleagues with other expertise. And social support, obviously. Um, and they also thought it was good with health literacy and involvement that people were very involved in the decisions themselves. So there are some actionable facilitators to optimal pain management after SCI. And that include education, um, better communication regarding neuropathic pain, and improve patient access to uh, non-pharmacological um, options. So that's one thing that we have worked on now for a few years to develop relevant pain education. And we are in the last uh, phase of that, I would say. So uh, we have interviewed people with spinal cord injuries, moderate to severe pain, the significant others to give us feedback on something that we have actually developed. Um, and we wanted to have their input on comprehensibility, clarity, content, and format. Um, and we had a lot of discussions and revisions of themes. It's important to try to make it as unbiased as possible. So some of the results there, uh, overall, um, it was very well received by people with spinal cord injury and their significant others. And it helped them to better understand. And you can see here some of the, the quotes that people said they, they, they really like to hear, people with spinal cord injury really like to hear from other people with spinal cord injury because those of us who are able-bodied, we don't have the same uh, credibility. So it has to come from people who have the injuries. Um, there was also some family members that actually had no idea. Um, and this is the last, the, the last quote here that you can see is that it was a completely new world that I didn't know about. I wish I would have known this when he had the accident to understand more. So some family members had no idea what this was because you, they kind of think about it as pain that anybody can get and you just get the treatment and you're fine. You take a Tylenol and you're fine. It's not the same thing. Um, they wanted to have some more clarification. So we've, we have um, added that. Um, so explaining pain and its mechanisms a little better. We did include a little bit of neurophysiology into the education um, and explain the different pain types. Um, and they wanted to have some clarification of terminology. I mean, we think we use these terms all the time and we provided a word list actually so that people would understand. Um, and content, that was the word list, uh, more relevant resources, more information about cannabis and opioids, more information about self-management and pain aggravation and information about pain in general. So people wanted more of everything. So we have, um, we have actually adjusted that uh, and revised it. And uh, then with format, that varies a lot. 
So now we're just having like a written format, but of course this could be serve as a basis for other uh, forms of it. In the new grant that we have, we're using it as a PowerPoint presentation, group discussions. So we can do it in different ways. So I can do videos, there's all kinds of, of, of apps one could do. So, I mean, it's once we have the final version, um, we can adapt it to many different things. And the idea is to make it available to anybody who wants it. So this is just showing you a few of the pages that we have in this, uh, what it actually looks like. Um, and you can see here that this is module two, it's two modules. So here is like, uh, something about nociceptive pain, what it feels like, where it can be located, um, neuropathic pain, what that is, where it can be located, what pain is, how it's affected by different things, real life cases of pain. And, and you can see the, the purple quotes here, just all quotes from people verbatim, um, and also the impact of pain, how pain can impact life after spinal cord injury. That's the first module. The second module is more uh, focused on management. So ways to manage pain. Um, and and uh, we focus on pharmacological, of course, and what people do to, to manage their pain and what, what uh, physicians think. So pain management perspective, healthcare providers, that was something that was very well received by, by patients because sometimes there's almost like a miss communication there where people think that the, the doctors are not really interested in helping them. And they don't understand that it's also a really big problem for doctors too, it's a difficult problem. So, so many uh, people that we interviewed really liked to see those quotes from physicians. Um, and uh, um, then they also wanted some support for uh, their significant other's family members. And they also wanted to hear about different things such as exercise. So the next steps with that is actually to finalize the healthcare professionals interviews and qualitative analysis. We actually uh, have only that left. And as you can see here, Kim Anderson is my collaborator. And there's lots of people involved in this. It's a team effort. Alberto Martinez Arizala, Salome Perez, so psychologist at the VA, and Lindsay Calico as a psychologist over at the VA, Lorian Fleming, who was our research coordinator, and Linda Rubio, Rio Frio, who is a, a neuroscience student. So, so what we have um, left to do here is to revise it further once we get all the um, all the healthcare providers perspectives. One of the things that I thought was really good in the last one we interviewed, I believe, uh, she said that she felt like we shouldn't start with the, the pharmacological ones, we should start with self management, and the non pharmacological and then put the next because she said that's the way she sees it in her clinic, that she likes people to do what they can first, and then we start with medication. So it, I guess it's different philosophies, how people want to do it. So, so we're considering that. So then uh, this, is the, um, there, this is where we are right now. We were fortunate enough to get a, uh, an expansion grant from the Department of Defense, uh, which is really um, uh, directly based on our previous DOD funded studies and the Craig Nielsen funded studies showing that they want adequate information regarding their treatment options and pain itself and better access to non-pharmacological option. So that's, that's the, the, the idea behind this grant. Uh, I can say that it was um, not, um, the funding mechanism did not allow for a clinical trial. So it's not really a clinical trial in the, in the classical sense. Um, so um, we have, uh, let me see. Yes, yeah, so, so we also wanted to, to be consistent with those recommendations that support the combination of, of com pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions. So that this is a non-pharmacological approach, but it will still allow people to use 
medication. We we're not going to exclude anybody who, who is on medication. They can, this is just an add on. So the first aim that we have is really to explore the perspectives on multimodal pain program. And our pain program includes pain education, exercise and bodily illusions using qualitative interviews. Um, and in order for people, of course, to, to provide any input, they need to experience it firsthand. Um, and then we also want to determine the association with manageable pain and global impression of change. So the reason why we, we chose manageable pain as one of the sort of assessments of, of, of effect is because we know that this, uh, that pain intensity is not necessarily the best measure, although it's used in a lot of clinical trials, but pain intensity can be very similar. It can be, we say it is pain intensity is the same at baseline or whatever, before an intervention and after. But now this person is very active. They're doing things that they didn't do before. So then you miss that. And it, it is then regarded as a failure. So it's very important to look a little bit broader at it, I believe. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. And we're then going to associate these uh, different phases or statistically with with neuropathic pain phenotypes, psychosocial phenotypes, and cognitive measures of body representation. So the first week is just screening and information and enrollment and, and our assessment strategies. The pain education is week two to five. So we have like a weekly session, group session with where we want to give people um, access to the research team. So for example, if we talk about pain medication, then we want Alberto Martinez to be there. If we talk about exercise level, well, then we want those co-investigators, including Mark Nash, um, to, to be there and, and uh, provide some input if there are questions. Um, and then uh, week six to 11, we do exercise and visual illusion. And that's a combination then of things. And I will tell you a little bit what that is. Um, and then we do a follow-up. So that's the sort of outline of the study. So the interventions is what I talked about, uh, pain education. It's upper body circuit training. That's something that comes from Mark Nash's lab. And they've done a lot of work on, and I believe it's in national uh, um, recommendations too for exercise. So that's something that we will do. And then we're gonna do visual illusion and body representation. Um, and that will involve uh, primarily legs. We, we use the hand for assessment of, uh, to quantify the illusion. So, so that's what you can see here with, with Linda um, sitting with the, you see what you do basically is that you have your hand hidden, um, but you see a rubber hand and that's what's lighted up there. And it's, you brush your real hand or the experimenter brush the real hand and the rubber hand at the same time synchronously. And then what happens is that the brain tries to make sense out of it. Uh, and your uh, perception, if it's, a, if it's a successful illusion, your perception moves towards your body. So you assess the distance starting until after. And you can then uh, determine the, the sort of the magnitude of the illusion. It's very cool. So, you know, if anybody wants to try it, <laughs> I tried it. I thought it was very interesting, actually. Um, it felt like it was my hand after a while, even though I knew it wasn't my hand. I thought the hand looked really nice and I <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting experience. So, but the intervention is not that. The intervention is a walking illusion. So we have people sitting in their chair and they're watching themselves um, in the mirror, the upper body. And then at the lower part of the body, there are legs that are moving so they can see and they're encouraged them to move their body as if they were walking. And this is then uh, hopefully um, going to manipulate some of the, the, the brain 
multisensory integration so that they get pain relief. So finally here, these are the kind of assessments we do. We usually have a pretty heavy assessment uh, strategy. We try to, to reduce it as much as we can. Uh, but if you wanna do phenotyping, you actually need to have a number of measures. So uh, we're looking at pain classification. Obviously that's just general screening and, and we wanna know what kind of pains people have. Uh, we're also gonna assess pain symptom severity. Um, we're going to use the neuropathic pain symptom inventory that we have uh, validated for spinal cord injury. Um, we're going to do QST. Um, we're going to, to measure psychosocial factors. I'm going to use the spinal cord injury version of the multidimensional pain inventory. Um, and that's also validated for, for spinal cord injury by us. Um, and it's actually what's interesting there is that you can get subgroups of people. So, so in it's been tested extensively in other chronic populations. And you have usually like three subgroups. One is the dysfunctional, which has very severe pain, lots of impact on their life, low life control, lower level of activity. You have the opposite, which is adaptive copers who have less pain and, and more of a normal profile. And then you have the middle uh, group uh, that we see in spinal cord injury specifically, which is uh, people who have severe pain, but they're still doing very well. They have low impact on their, their lives and they have a high quality of life despite the severe pain. And here's where the resilience and support comes in. So, so we have a very unique uh, population. And I think that that's the group we see most of at, at our gyms and stuff. There's people who do very well despite they have pain. And that's why people don't know that they have pain because they don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, we're going to do the body representation. I mentioned that. Um, and we also have a questionnaire for, for the subjective experience of the illusion. Um, and it's highlighting four components of this experiment or this experience. Embodiment of rubber hand. That means sense of ownership, like you feel it's your hand. Um, and movement and effect. So we will apply a similar method for the legs. We have the global measures I mentioned, days with manageable pain. Uh, that's something that we had recommended for the international extended uh, CI pain data set. So that's also established method and it's also um, in the NIH common data elements. And the patient global impression of pain. And then we're gonna do the qualitative interview. And that is basically uh, similar to what we've done before. So here we want to, that's Kim and I will do those. Um, and we will basically ask people their perspectives on the pros and cons of the different approaches, what they liked, what they didn't like, uh, what kind of effect it had on their pain, uh, and on manageable pain, what they think is manageable pain, um, so you can see it's very open-ended questions. So, so that means that after you have this transcribed and recorded, you need to provide a lot of analysis. So this is coming to the end of my, my talk here. And um, I, of course, want to thank all my previous colleagues and collaborators that worked on, on many of these. I haven't thanked everybody there, but the present ones, Kim Anderson, Lindsay, Alberto, Salma, Lorian, Roberta, Marlon, and Linda Robayo and Tyler. Thank you very much. And of course, research funding from the Department of Defense, Craig Nielsen Foundation, State of Florida, and the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. Uh, congratulations to everything you're achieving and, uh, and the group that you're bringing together to tackle this really super complicated problem. So it's fantastic. Uh, I'm sure you've written a couple of review articles, but what you just talked about would be a magnificent review article in terms of the total aspect of uh, what neuropathic pain is uh, and how you assess it. And then some of the work that you're doing to actually alleviate pain. Um, we can uh, open up for questions, uh, but I had just one, you know, Monica Perez, before she left, she wrote this really interesting study 
uh, from Annals of Neurology looking at incomplete um, uh, spinal cord injury uh, showing more spasticity in, in patient populations. And you just talked about how incomplete um, uh, flammical cortical or um, spinal flammics um, also seem to be associated with increased neuropathic pain. So is there a relationship between neuropathic pain and spasticity severity? Has that ever been done? Put those two things together? Yes, that was, that was part of, um, you know, Jackie Tibbetts thesis work mm -hmm. that my previous PhD student, she did some of that. Uh, yes, there is a relationship between it. A positive uh, relationship? Yes. Okay. It is. It is a positive relationship. And that was primarily based on, on self-report or wasn't based so much on, we tried to do some EMG and, and that didn't really, <laughs> that didn't really work so well. Uh, but uh, certainly with respect to uh, what triggers are of pain, spasticity, uh, and, and the perception of it and the occurrence of it. And it shows that people who have spasticity had more severe pain. Excellent. So definitely a relationship that could be studied much more. And uh, Stana has a uh, question in the chat. Are different phenotypes of neuropathic pain found in patients with the same or similar injuries or similar injuries evoke uh, similar types of pain? I think so. I think there are so many phenotypes. Um, I mean, the, the, the type of injury is sometimes not related to, to their pain. So it seems like, uh, except for incompleteness to a certain degree, but there are so many different phenotypes. Yeah. Very good. Okay, other questions? We have the world expert on neuropathic pain here with us this morning. Well, Eva, thank you very, very much. And I'm sure people will contact you if they have any additional questions. And yes, hope everyone please. have a great day on Thursday morning. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care.